Christian, this week, perhaps I chose the wrong week since we've got some that, are, that have spent the week uh, or at least the last few days sharing the gospel, but I'm going to use it anyways. This past week, how many times and with how many people have you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many hours have you spent in study of the Word of God? How many times, or how many hours, I suppose, have you spent in prayer? Now, I ask you this question. I don't know the answer to the questions in which I've just asked you. At least, I don't know your answer. I'm sure we all have different answers. Are you satisfied with that answer? If you're not satisfied, you probably have the pretty similar nature as I have. And uh, I'm not satisfied, but I've got some excuses. Usually more than one. I've got multiple. I've got reasons for why I'm not living the way that, I'm, that satisfies me in Christ and in a way that is really not pleasing to God. Let me tell you this. Those excuses are not nearly as good as Satan would have us to believe. This is my proposal. From this uh, section of Scripture, of Colossians 1, 17 through 23, if there's nothing else that you get from this message, let it be this. Everything ought to be centered around and revolving around and unto the glory of Christ and Christ alone. Indeed, this is what it means to be Christian. The Apostle Paul sets the example. He says, I've been made a minister of this. Now, I can't come to you and say I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm not an apostle and my name ain't Paul. But I can tell you what he's written, what he's passed down, having been inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, having been in, preserved by the Holy Spirit of God. The Scripture is that which we can have confidence in. And I can tell you this. He starts it off in this section with saying, this is all about Jesus he was before all things. In him all things hold together. That means there is nothing that in and of itself, if you will, in, in our thinking, that, that should not be considered religious. From what you eat to how you go to sleep, what you watch on television, the, mu the, the, the music that you take pleasure in, the conversations that you have, even if you're talking about the weather, you ought to be talking about God. Why? Because there is not a raindrop that falls which God does not control. Indeed, we have every opportunity, as long as we have the ability to speak, and those that don't have the ability to speak, they have the ability perhaps to write down things. If they don't have the ability to write down or to speak, perhaps they've passed on. But at this time, I can say of all of us, you have the ability, with the exception of my young daughter here, to speak. Now, she can say, Dad, Dad, that isn't quite going to work for getting the gospel out there. It's a start. Talk to Dad, there you go. But why do we not live Christ-centered lives? And I want to say this. The reason is uh, more that it's not as black and white as we would like for it to be. That is, it's not one simple answer. It's many. That is, first of all, you have an enemy. You have an enemy that would love for you to live any way other than to the glory of Christ. He wants you to live in a way that is not edifying or sanctifying to you, to your brother or sister in Christ Jesus. Indeed, He wants you to live and think in such a way that you have no desire or thoughts or concerns about your brother or sister in Christ. What more so, He would want you to live in such a way as you completely abandon the Great Commission and never speak of the gospel and salvation of Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is for every Christian. He wants every Christian to abandon it. Not only this, we have our own flesh nature. We still have sometimes this hostility toward, of mind toward God. Though the old things have passed away and new things are coming, we still struggle with the flesh. I do, and you do too. If you're not struggling with it, it's because you're letting uh, it have the victory over you. Stop doing that. Struggle with it. It's worth the struggle. And additionally with this, we have a, nature, a, a culture, a world that is around us that will not uh, 
uh, receive, at least not very peacefully, the gospel of Christ. Indeed, every evil action can be done, and it is not only uh, approved of, but is glorified by the world of which we live, of which is no longer our home. But you speak of the evils of that which is being done. You point out why it is evil, and that all of a sudden is inappropriate. But indeed, we find that the, the whole setting up of the, the statement here, he, Paul in Colossians 1.17, he's going to, as we'll see, he's going to talk about how we're rectified, uh, we're, we're reconciled to God and what that took, but it starts ultimately with who God is. And so too, everything that we do needs to start with who God is. There is a, a Christ-centered nature in Scripture. Indeed, uh, Christ, when he's walking with, after his crucifixion and resurrection, on the road to Emmaus with his disciples, he starts beginning with Moses. And then the law and the prophets, that's your Old Testament, brethren. And he explains how the Scripture is speaking of him. And when he was rebuking the, the Pharisees, he says, listen, you don't believe the, the writings of Moses, though you've dedicated your lives to them. If you believed those, then you would believe in me because he wrote about me. So all of Scripture is centered around Christ. The Old Testament was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah and the redemption of the world. And now the New Testament says this is what he did accomplished exactly that, and now we're looking forward to when He comes and brings glory to His people and defeat to His enemies. So there's a Christocentric nature to Scripture, so too there is the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation revolves around and centers around Christ, not man, but Christ. Brethren, if whatever your confession is, if it revolves around you doing something, I like the way St. Augustine put it. It says, you contributed nothing to your salvation except your great need for it. The doctrine of salvation centers around the work which Christ has done on the cross and is doing in you. And so too the lives of the redeemed ought to center around Christ. Now, this application that I'm about to give, it doesn't work in Kentucky. And for some of our visitors, you may have noticed my accent. That's because I'm not from Nevada. I've been told nobody's from Pahrump. We all find a way to get here. But, uh, you know, this application is this. Have you ever found somebody that won tens of millions of dollars and their life never changed? Just stayed the same way. Now, in Kentucky, they probably would. If, if certain individuals wanted uh, money like that, they'd just put it in the bank and they'd still live the same way, working on their tractors and wearing their overalls, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a simple way of life and a peaceful way of life. But generally speaking, somebody makes a whole bunch of money all of a sudden, uh, their lives change, don't they? Well, so too it is. One who has been radically changed by God. Christian, what you're confessing by taking that title is you have come in contact with the Almighty God and He has forever changed you radically from one who was hostile to mine to one who loves Him, to one who was seeking their own glory and their own pleasure to one who seeks the glory of God. Christian, how have you sought the glory of God this week? If you don't like the answer that you give to yourself, I ask you this, how will you seek God's glory this coming week? Now I want to say this as well though, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, not one of us. If we're not guaranteed tomorrow, we're definitely not guaranteed a whole week, but good Lord willing, or as my grandmother said, good Lord willing, the creek don't rise, but if it rises this far, we're in trouble. We'll have that week. How will you approach the coming week? Will it be that you will seek the salvation of the lost? Will it be that you will seek that you yourself will grow? Let me tell you, if that is what you truly desire, it will not happen on accident. 
but it will happen by getting into the Word of God and getting into prayer of God. You say, well, I don't have time to do that. What is taking up your time? Know this, Satan is really good at throwing a bunch of stuff at us, things that aren't even necessarily evil, so he can get you so busy that you cannot live for Christ. But Christian, I testify this to you. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. You belong to God. And He has given you a work of which you are to do, which is the, the works of a Christian, and not for salvation, but because of them, that we would spend time in prayer, which I don't know about you. I don't know how I'd get through the week if I didn't. And maybe you're struggling to get through the week. And I say, uh, how often... And for how long are you in prayer? And I'm not talking about a 10-minute wish list to a cosmic Santa Claus of the things that he wants you to, or want, he want, you want him to give to you to make your week easier. No, I'm talking about, God, I just want to come to you. I want to have a conversation with you. I want to hear your voice. I want you to give me understanding of your word. I want you to, to reveal to me who you are that I may know you better and worship you better and obey you better. Indeed, this is the purpose of Scripture, that it would reveal God to us, that we would know Him. This Scripture is also the key of knowing who you are. Propose this, if a person doesn't know the Word of God, they don't know who they are. And there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money and a lot of time looking for who they are, when all they have to do is open the Word of God. Indeed, you will not know who you are until you come to know God. Christian, this is who you were. And I don't know the details of all of your testimonies. I don't need to. I know the Word of God to be the truth. You were once alienated from God. That is, you were not in connection with God. You were not in a relationship that is positive with God. Outside of Christ Jesus, that is the, the condition of all men. They are alienated from God. Indeed, Romans 3 sums it up uh, really nice and says, There are none who seek for God. That is the condition of natural man. Not only this, you were hostile in mind toward God. You were his enemy. And he died for you anyways. He sought to lavish you with his love, despite the fact you were hostile to him. And so, rather than sacrificing His justice, He didn't do that. He sacrificed His Son so that our God remains holy and is also merciful and loving. You were alienated from God and you could do nothing about it. You were a helpless, wretched sinner. And He says, I will come down to you and I will establish this relationship so that by His blood we have a holy adoption and by His Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. Those who were once hostile, not only this, but consider this if you will. If we were once alienated from God but are now in relationship with God, if we were once hostile toward God but now are to have a love for God, and indeed if somebody does something this amazing for you, how can you not love them? But we were also once engaged in evil deeds. Christian, this can no longer be your walk. Your ability to walk away from your evil deeds, your salvation doesn't depend upon it. But I'll tell you this, that's going to be evidence of a true conversion. One of the, the most common questions that pastors, and it's not just me, it's every pastor I've ever spoken to, he says, my congregation comes to me. And they come to me and they say, Pastor, how can I know that I'm saved? You know, I, I meditate upon that question, and, and different pastors give different answers, but I want you to consider this. The one who is saved is the one who is loved by God in a special, powerful, relational way and has come to be conformed so that he loves God as well. That is how we can know we're saved. Not only that, but of course, we also have the promises of the scripture as well, that there is nothing that has ever been created, high or low, in the heavens or on earth, which can separate us from the love of God. 
But why do we come to the conclusion? Why do we come to the time of questioning, how can I know if I'm truly saved? I propose this. It's because we continue engaging in evil deeds. When we look at ourselves and say, man, I know what I should be. I know who the pastor says I should be. By the way, don't go off what your pastor says. Go off what the Word of God says. I know what I should be, but I keep falling short. I keep engaging in these evil deeds. First of all, if you're seeing that it's evil, know this, that is a blessing of God. For the one who is engaged in evil deeds but does not see it and has no conviction is the one that will never turn from it until he is given sight and given conviction. If God has placed it upon your heart that you are convicted about your sin, hallelujah! But know this, that conviction is not synonymous with repentance. That conviction is what leads to repentance. For conviction is just an emotion. I feel really bad that I'm doing this. If it if repentance doesn't follow, then conviction is wasted emotion. I've been troubled for a time, but I'm not going to change. You know, I, I went uh, for our visitors and some uh, others. I, I've been struggling terribly with, uh, with my gallbladder and with health, and I've, I've learned fatty foods and sugary foods and red meat, they hurt me. Sometimes they hurt me really bad, but man, it's just so good though, isn't it? Yeah, yesterday is a good example. I'm hurting this morning because of it. Yeah, they had those potato things that they just go around and around, and it's this big long potato, and they're really hard to eat. And, and man, they, you know, the one who knows, okay, this is wrong, and I shouldn't do this, and I feel really bad that I'm doing this, but they keep on doing this. What a pitiful thing indeed. They deserve the pain. Perhaps the pain will turn them away. And I keep telling myself every day, tomorrow I'm starting a new diet. <laughs> Christian, don't tell yourself tomorrow I'm starting a sanctified walk. <laughs> Start it now. Because tomorrow's not promised. Let today, if you've never come to know Christ, let today be the day of salvation. In fact, let this very hour be the hour. For who knows, perhaps you might be killed on the way home. Driving is one of the most dangerous things an American can do, particularly in a retirement community with roundabouts. Who thought that one through? <laughs> to be engaged in evil deeds is not the mark of a Christian, but to be repenting from evil deeds. To have a hatred. God, I hate this which has been in me. Know this, that hatred for sin is a gift from God to you. That you would hate that which is worthy of being hated and love the one who is worthy of your love. But one cannot have peace with sin. Or they can, they shouldn't. They should not have peace with sin and call it peace with God. But to have peace with God means we are at war against the sin which remains in us until it is no more. And this is how we can stand firmly in the faith, being established and being steadfast and being unmoved. If you will conquer the, if you will, the little sins in your lives, day in and day out, what you will find, if you will engage them in battle, is God will grant you the victories day in and day out. And you may find for yourself, this is a long season. I'm going, I'm still struggling with it. I'm getting victory. Sometimes I'm getting defeats. But there will come a day, perhaps, in which you will find, oh, I'm no longer struggling with that sin. I've conquered that sin, that habit. Now I've got a new one. And actually, it's not a new one. It's been there the whole time. I didn't see it because there was this sin, if you will, that was the tree blocking the forest. And now I see there's another one. And I'm ready to engage that one, that sin in battle as well. And indeed, if you will do that, what you will find is God gave you the victory then. Why would He not give you the victory there as well? Indeed, God is unchanging. He is going, his, his ways are perfect. 
and he relates to us in a way which his word reveals to us so that we can know him. God should not, though there are aspects of God that we can't comprehend, you'll never comprehend, but God in his nature in general should not be a mystery to his children for he has revealed himself to us by his word and by his spirit, even by all of creation. Romans 1 says, all have known God from general revelation, but exchange the truth of God for a lie so that they can chase after their sins. But Christian, you are the one who says, I am no longer chasing after my sin. Consider which one you will live for this morning, Christian. Will you live for this world or will you live for Christ? For this world will lead you with promises and deliver unto you disappointment and ultimately destruction, the one who follows it to its end. The narrow path which Christ, which, which is Christ in the Christian walk, this leads to life and victory everlasting. And indeed, let me, if I will, uh, proclaim this victory for all who are in Christ. The scripture says, He has now reconciled you. That is, Christ has reconciled you with the Father through His flesh and blood being broken and poured out for us through death on a cross, being crushed by the Father so that He may present you, Christian, the one who was once sinner, but now a saint in Christ, a child of God. He will present you to the Father who is holy and blameless and beyond reproach. And you, despite the fact that you and I have sinned against God, we are we clothed in the righteousness of Christ and will be holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Consider what that means, beyond reproach. That means who can bring a charge against God's elect? For the one whom God has forgiven, there is no higher court than the judge which is God. And he is just forgiven. This one has been reconciled. His wages of sin have been purged through the blood of Jesus Christ. This is what is in Christ. This is not for super saints. There's no such thing. This is for Christians, every Christian and only Christians. That is those who are in Christ Jesus. If you do not yet know him this morning, let me present to you, if I can, the gospel in a short and hopefully understandable way. There is only one God. He is holy. He will not allow sin to go unpunished. There's no little sin. The wages of sin is death. That is eternal separation from God. And friend, you have sinned against God. I don't know how. I don't know when. And that's not for me to know. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God doesn't grade on a curve. You don't get to look at the person next to you, beside you, in front of you, behind you, and say, this one's worse than me. Send me to heaven. Send them down there. No. No, the standard is perfection. It is his law, and his son has walked in perfect obedience. And so your neighbor's unrighteousness is not your righteousness. But take this to heart as well. Their righteousness is also not your failure. For God does not look at them and say, listen, you didn't stand up, you didn't now do as well as this Christian did, so I'm sending you away. No. Instead, God has sent His Son, Jesus the Christ, born in Nazareth some roughly 2,000 years ago, who lived a flawless, with a flawless life with no sin underneath the law of God and ultimately was crucified on a Roman cross having been put there by Jewish religious leaders and though the cross itself was terrible by human standards and human eyes what was worse was while on that cross the on that cross, the Father crushed the Son for the sins of all who would believe. He who knew no sin became sin, that we would become the righteousness of God. And so salvation is by the free gift of grace, forgiveness of sins, which is taken hold of by the empty hand of faith, resting in the promises of God. And one who rests in Him is one who must be born again. 
That is, you cannot remain in your flesh. You cannot remain of this world. For to do so, you would not be able to set your eyes on the biblical heaven, the heaven that is about the worship of who God is, what He has done. Oh no, a fallen man has no desire to see that God. He wants a heaven revolving around Him. He wants a, re a world revolving around Him. But Christian, you are not a good man. Lost person, you're not a good man either. That's okay. Well, it's not okay. It's terrible. There is no worse title in the universe than sinner. It's one who has rebelled against God. But he, through Christ Jesus, is making you new. And indeed, all who put their trust in him, there will be none who are disappointed. And we are saved by grace through faith apart from works, for the purpose of works. So Christian, I'm talking to you now if I can. Know this, if you say, okay, I've come to salvation, I'm going to wait until I die. And then I'm going to experience relationship with God. That ain't right. And indeed, I question. If you're not in a relationship with Him now, what makes you think you're saved at all? Mm -hmm. But you can be. For indeed, salvation is that relationship with God. Our reward is God. Not that we would become gods, but that we would be in relationship with Him and it be a positive one. And know this, the time is drawing near in which this type of message, this calling, will no longer be. For the time of repentance and salvation will be over. If you will look in Genesis, there was a great flood. God judged the world with water. And with that, uh, he chose for himself one man, a total of eight people. It was his family. He built an ark. He obeyed God. He trusted in the promise that God had said. He says, hey, I'm going to flood the world. That's something that's never happened before. It seems to go against everything that you know, but it's the word of God and Noah obeyed him. And it took him a long time to build that boat. The book of Peter tells us that he was pre a preacher of righteousness. So he was professing, listen, there's a coming judgment. Repent of your sins and be saved. But no one paid attention to him. At the right time, they entered in to that ark, and God shut the door to that ark. That ark is a foreshadowing of Jesus the Christ. All who are in him shall be saved. There is no other path to God except through him. And that water is a foreshadowing of the judgment by fire which is coming, the justice of God upon this world, an eternal judgment. Now is the day of salvation. Repent, therefore, and be saved. And you can know, if indeed you're in Christ, you can know that these promises for you, a promise of eternal life, with which there is no suffering, you can know this is true for you if you will continue in the faith being firmly established and steadfast. A lot of people ask, well, what about these examples? You know, I hold to the doctrine of eternal security. One who is truly born again and truly saved cannot uh, lose their salvation. They will not. That's not according to their nature. They are sealed by the, the Spirit of God. They're held in the hand of both the Father and the Son. Ain't nothing getting them out of God's reach or out of God's hand. But they say, well, what about these people? They say, I'm, I'm a Christian. And then they go and they live like the world. And then sooner or later they say, ah, uh, agnostic or atheist or so have you. We're told in Scripture, those who are truly disciples of Christ, it is not that you repented and believed then, but that you repented and believed then and continue to repent and believe now. That's how you're doing it now is what says, okay, then was true. For indeed, it's not a fallen man a liar, even a liar to the point that he believes his own lies. For indeed... A fool says in his heart there is no God. Why? He's told himself so many times that there's no God, he believes it. So too it is with many. They've deceived themselves. Don't put your trust in any work of your hand, but in the work in which Christ has accomplished for you. And you will find this will establish you firmly. Indeed, the foundation is upon the rock, which is Christ, and not shifting sands which are easily removed or destroyed. 
Indeed, you can know these promises are true if you are not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. And brethren, I apologize for the weakness of my words, but I will tell you this. The gospel doesn't change. There is one true gospel, and I like to present it as well as John the Baptist and Christ did in his early ministry. The kingdom of God is at hand. Indeed, as John the Baptist says, the axe is even now at the root, that it would chop and, and cast them into the fires of judgment. Repent. Turn away from your sins. Turn to God and believe in the gospel of Christ Jesus. Christian, this is a good message for you and I as well, and that we need the gospel every day. Uh, we say, well, the, I preach a the same sermon over and over again, even though I only do it once on Sunday mornings, i got to preach it to myself often because we need this gospel. We need to be reminded of it. And we're told in this scripture, the gospel is proclaimed in all of creation under heaven. Indeed, the Great Commission, which is uh, to go forth and make disciples of the world, even in the midst of tribulation, as we see in Matthew 24, it will go to every tribe, tongue, and nation. The book of Revelation tells us that every tribe, tongue, and nation will have a representative to testify that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christ is victorious in this world despite the tribulation, and it is much. You will find tribulation if you will live your faith propose this, a true Christian faith is a personal faith, but it is not a private faith. How many people have you shared the gospel with this past week, Christian? Oh, indeed, I wake up every morning hoping, and I'll tell you, I fail far too often, but hoping that, that no one will have to ask me if I am a Christian, that no one will have to beg me to give them the gospel Perhaps they'll beg me to stop, <laughs> though I don't look for that either. As one writer once put it, he says, If you were accused of being a Christian in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Christian, this is my question to you. Are you resting in that steadfast hope, and indeed not only resting in it, but putting it into action? The time for your rest is not now. It is coming. You know, I like the way uh, Pastor Bobby at Heritage put it to me one time uh, recently. He says, you know, if this world is a boat, it's not a luxury cruise ship, which Christians ought to be just enjoying it. This is a battleship. We have an enemy that is ruling in the hearts of our loved ones. And we want their salvation. Not only so they don't go to hell, not only even so that they go to heaven, but so even now they would be filled with the joy and the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. Indeed, brethren, there is no good excuse for our silence. This world cannot afford our silence. And God is worthy of us to speak of His truth. And if you want to find a place to start, Colossians 1 Starting in verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things are held together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross through him. I say whether things on heaven or things, or sorry, on earth or things in heaven. Brethren, let us now be alienated from the old flesh and the sins which once ruled over us. For indeed, Christ himself said, He who practices sin is a slave to it but we are now slaves of righteousness. What a wonderful relationship. If you have not yet come to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, 
to which I mean both Lord and Savior. If Christ is not the Lord of your life, let us not say then that He is yet the Savior of your soul. But He can. He can be. He can be today. Oh, that you would cry out to Him. Indeed, I always try to say it whenever I can, don't leave here until you have come to have a saving relationship with Christ. Until you have come by the blood of Christ to be at peace with God. No longer at peace with sin. We're going to open the altar at this time for this purpose. So that you can have this opportunity. But I will say this. Your opportunity to repent and believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. It doesn't end when the music ends. You may have a, a terror of crowds. You don't even need me to come to Christ. Uh, or any pastor for that reason. Go to him in prayer. For the curtain has been torn at the cross of Jesus. You can now go to the Father and plead for your salvation through no other but Jesus Christ, the Son. If you will, please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would be gracious and kind to us this very morning. Indeed, your grace and your patience has been amazing. I can testify even in my own life. The innumerable times that I deserve to be struck down and sent to eternal destruction. But instead, your plan for me was to glorify your grace, your love, and your mercy. And so you struck down your son on that cross. Lord, I ask that you would grant us uh, growth that you would feed your sheep, that we would become stronger, uh, not that we would rest in our own strength as Christians, but rather that we would be equipped by your word to do every good work. And Lord, if there is anyone here this morning who does not yet know you, regardless of how long they may have taken on the title Christian, regardless of how many times they may have been baptized, or regardless of what they may think others may think of them, Lord, I ask that those things would be laid down. I ask that they would put their trust for the first time in Jesus Christ and Him alone. A salvation by grace apart from works but resulting in works. This is our hope. And these things I pray in Christ's name. Amen.